wow, it's like kind of cool, you know? Hey, guess what, Jolene? What's up? Like outside of just us being in an ulterior space, we're live. Totally. <laughs> Are you gonna join me in a totally meditation one day? Um, we can, but actually, we're gonna have to actually like switch this back to normal because clearly, it didn't work for us. It doesn't what show. Happened? YouTube was hating. Um, hey, have you, have you updated your that? Zoom? Hmm? Have you updated your Zoom? Uh, yes, I did actually. Ah, hold on. There we have Wait, it. Did that make a difference? Hey. No, not really, but it's okay. <laughs> What's up, everybody? This is Trade Talk Tuesday, and we wanted to have something special, but we're, we'll work on those kinks. You kind of got to see a little something, you know, cool, and then it left. So, guess who was the first person here today? Reggie. It was Reggie. I don't know what it is, but Reggie, like, just, <laughs> you know, one day, Reggie, we're going to, we may have to flip the script a little bit, maybe even come in a minute earlier or, you know, well, we don't believe in being late. So we may just be a minute earlier or just right on time. So, you know, what do you think about that, Jolene? Just to make it a little bit fair for everybody. Yeah, I guess. I mean, he he's just be on it though. That is true. Right? So we can't we can't fault the man for being on time and everything else. Like my grandfather used to always say, "You're on time if you're early. You're you're what is it? You're you're late if you're on time. And if you are late, then you should have never showed up at all." So wait, yeah. some people did see the background mark. Yeah, they saw my background, but you weren't in the background. It kept flipping us from screen to screen. So we'll work on the kinks. We'll figure this out. If Even if we have to create our own, Joanne, mm -hmm. even if we have to create our own layout for the come up series, it's going to happen. I'm with it. Outside of that, let's get, let's get to this stuff. How are you? How are you doing? I'm good, you know. Nordstrom's is acting right. Oh, you mean the on the retail side? On, on the consumer side, yes. I'm not talking about investing. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. All right. Well, there's that. All right. So what's up, everybody? I'm Mark Monroe, accompanied by my friend, my co-host, my co-producer, and spirit animal, and art extraordinaire, none other than the wonderful... The land you see and the place to be. What does it, cousin? Oh, I see the intros. And this is Trade Talk all Tuesday. The time. Yeah, I know, right? I know. I usually type it. I usually don't say it. So now I got to type it. Uh oh, see? Now we're. No, mm, okay. All right. So, anyways, today is Trade Talk Tuesday. And as you can see from today's headline, it's definitely keep that same energy. And you'll find out why. Anyway, so today we have a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, but first things first, let's get some of the stuff out of the way. If you haven't subscribed, go ahead and subscribe because then that way you can become a part of the family and then you get to meet all these awesome, super dope, super duper dope people that are also known as the cousins or primos or whatever you, whatever it is that's in a native tongue that means cousin. So then you can join this wonderful, awesome group of people on this mission towards generational wealth. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button down below if you like what we do and if you like our content and if you think that today's episode is going to be dope, go ahead and hit that like button. I guess apparently it gets out to some other new people and who much that will probably hit the algorithm. And on top of that, if you want to be like Reggie, who's always somewhat how in the know and always first, Reggie, tell us your secret. What is your secret? Anyways, go ahead and hit that bell. And that way you can be a part of the notification squad, AKA the Cool Kids Club. So without further ado, I am going to pass it on to the wonderful Jolyn GC. Take it away. Okay. Sorry, I was like posting on <laughs> social. What's up y'all, it's Jolyn GC and the place to be in today is Trade Talk Tuesday. Back into the market. Okay, so the Dow was down, um, or actually the Dow was up. 3.36 points. The S&P 500 was down 0 0.90 points, so not even one full point. Uh, the NASDAQ was down negative uh, 48.56 points. The VIX was up 17.56. And then if we get down to the sector performance, as you know, there are 11 sectors. And 
within those sectors, there's over 60 industries. So if you guys are like trying to figure out, you know, your approach to the market, you can start with the major indices, which I just talked about, the Dallas and P500, NASDAQ. Then you break that down to sector performance and the sectors, there are 11 of them. We track the top three and the bottom three. So the top three were energy, financials, and industrials. And the bottom three, which were all in the negative today, can, oh, excuse me, communication services, health, and utilities. Then for our pick performance, you can find our picks, aka our sips, on our Instagram page at that come up series. Um, you just scroll through and you'll find the post that has the latest um, picks. I know there's about 37 of those. And we have XPO coming in at number one, uh, TBT, and then CWeb. And then on the bottom, the bottom three, I want you to um, write this down because this was. <laughs> just get ready for it oh gosh okay so write this ticker down we have the i'm just gonna say the tickers we have dollar sign s n p s dollar sign r o k u and dollar sign t s l a oh <laughs> <laughs> I so know you so many names, y'all. I gotta, I gotta say, keep it all tickers, <laughs> all tickers. Um, yeah. But Microsoft had a fifty-two week high today. Um, so that's shout out to Microsoft. That's cool. Yes. Um, and you know we're gonna get into this Black History. Yes. To, the uh, Chancellor, historian Brian Clayette. <laughs> Let me see. All right, you guys ready? You guys just have to excuse me. We'll talk about why I'm just so, we'll talk about it after we get into this black history. It has a lot to do with AMD. Oh. Okay, <laughs> so on April 27th, 1903. Um, so actually today, so, this was today in history. Today is also my little niece's birthday. Shout out to Ziggy Zow, Ziggy Zow, Zow. Happy birthday. Um, the Souls of Black Folks, it was published by W.E.B. Du Bois. So <clears throat> one of America's most monumental literary works of African-Americans, The Souls of Black Folks, was published today, April 27, 1903. W.E.B. Du Bois was born on February 23rd, 1868 in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. He was a historian, civil rights activist, sociologist, author, editor, and pan-Africanist. In 1909, he was also one of the founders of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, AKA the NAACP. On February 12th, 1909, in response to a race riot in Springfield, Illinois, and the horrific acts that were being done against African-Americans, a little over 50 white liberals and seven African-Americans met to discuss the racial crisis. Out of this meeting came the existence of the NAACP. Some of the African-Americans in attendance were W.E.B. Du Bois, Ida B. Wills Barnett, and Mary Church Terrell. Among the white liberals at the meeting were Mary White Ovington and Oswald Garrison Villard. The organization continued the focus of the Niagara Movement, which was the precursor to the NAACP. So just Yesterday, on April 26, 1994, the first all-race election held in South Africa uh, took place. So um, it lasted for three days, and millions stood patiently in lines, often for hours over the voting period. This election led to South Africa's first Black president, Nelson Mandela. Mandela's African National Congress garnered 62,000... What? Oh, I'm sorry, there's a, there's a typo in here. 65% or 12,237,655 of the 19, over 19 million votes resulting in Mandela's election and 252 seats won by the ANC. The election concluded a four-year process that put an end to apartheid. So April 27th is now known as Freedom Day, a public holiday in South Africa. So shout out to all of our South Africans. Happy Freedom Day. That is amazing. I love that. So shout out to y'all. Light yourself up in the chat. I want to see the flags. If you're repping for South Africa, light it up in the chat. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. There you go, Jolene. 
<laughs> Thanks, I Wait, can I actually say something about Nelson Mandela, though, by the way? Yeah, go for it. You know, Nelson Mandela and I share something in common. Uh, what? We were born on the same day. Oh, nice. You know what day, who shares my birthday? So lucky who might that be? My birthday. You know who, who might that be? I think I know. Oprah. I was going to say, yeah, Oprah. Yes, she has my birthday. Isn't that Good nice? Black excellence. Mm-hmm. Um, All right. So yeah, I was gonna say you, yo, you tri- yo, I'll let you, I'll let you take it, I'll let you start. Go ahead. Okay, so y'all, I'm a little out of source because honestly, this this particular stock, which I don't even know how we relate yet. I feel like it's I feel like it's a it's a cousin of some sort. I'm not even sure. But yo, this when I tell you that this particular stock tested my gangster i mean as far as sticking to the script um waking up wondering you know what was what you know reading all these articles like just trying to keep myself focused on the script and then figuring out like okay what are they going to do for earnings um what's going on dang should i pivot should i no i can't take this loss like i can't do it i can't do it and just holding firm through the correction yo a and B stressed your girl out. <sighs> stressed your girl out. But then A and D must have had a come to moment because they gathered themselves up, put on the coat of armor, and just got to marching on up, marching on up that chart. Just they just kept going, kept going. And I do have to say that. This des- definitely this experience with AMD um, was like no other. Um, I didn't have this experience with any other chip stocks, not yeah. NVIDIA. Yeah. And we had our things with NVIDIA, not even SMH just in general, because, you know, SMH is always stock based, always. But AMD, man, there was um, it wasn't a toxic relationship. Mm. It was one of those relationships where you felt like, do I like them more than they like me? Like, what's up? That's how it felt like. But today, y'all, we had that talk. You know, what are we? And now we know. We know. And I'm just, I'm glad that we, you know, stuck to the script and just stuck it out. Um, And I look forward to more things, especially given what AMD shared in their um, earnings report. So, yeah. Well, (laughs) <laughs> Speaking of the report, because we're going to keep that same energy when we go through yes. this report. And on top of that, I'm going to do something a little special today. Instead of us just going through earnings report like we normally do, mm-hmm. I want to kind of like enter people into the minds of like my focus for, and, and I'm probably sure that Joe Lynn's focus is so that way everybody can start thinking a little bit more institutional so that way like the one of the greatest books that have, uh, that has been written is the art of war and one of it says is know thy opponent mm-hmm. and so if your opponent happens to be institutional money then you need to understand exactly how institutional money could possibly see things so essentially we may even like you know relate it into we may actually put like the understanding of how is it that you should understand the rules of this game and how this board is set up in the form of looking at it from a totally different perspective, something that we can all recognize when you go to those family cookouts and everything else. Mm-hmm. I mean, this could break friendships, relationships with other people, or essentially it could draw you closer together. And it's a game that we've all played before, or, you know, for most of us. Um, so my attempt later on today is to probably try to associate our understanding of how the market operates or how company, how institutional investors see companies, like in the form of playing a game space. Okay. Well, you know, I'm with it. I got my water, you know. So where should we begin? Because we've had some pretty dope earnings. Like, for example, we had AMD come out with some pretty blockbuster earnings and then raising their full year guidance. We had, I, I don't need, I guess we don't really need to talk about Microsoft, though, that they had blockbuster revenue. Like they, like, we're talking about record breaking revenue for Microsoft. And that was huge, though, that the stock got hammered. But I think that was just because of the, f- the fact that the stock went to its 52-week high mm-hmm. off, you know, off the muscle long before it even reached uh, earnings. So normally when you see a stock going to 52-week highs, going into earnings, then you're going to see probably most likely a sell-off. So 
I think that that's temporary, but in the grand scheme of things, I think that the stock is still going higher. Um, and then on top of that, you know, I, I'd be remiss if we don't talk about the unsung hero over here by the name of Google yeah, or AKA guess, Alphabet. We do got to talk about it. Let's talk about AMD since we already talked about the experience. Let's go to AMD. Definitely want to get into Google. Um, who else you want to talk about? Oh, that should be it. Well, I mean, of course, you know, I'm going to have to talk about Tesla, you know. People are coming at me like, yo, hey, if, you, if you're going to talk about Netflix, then keep that same energy when, when it's time to talk about your friend Tesla or my bae, Tesla. So I have no problem with that. Wait a minute. Tesla is your bae now? You already know what it was. So there, there's, <laughs> you knew what this was. You know what this relationship was. I thought Tesla was, was something else to you. Tesla Look is here. my scale bae. Look here. If I'm the Moses of bringing everybody to electric vehicles... <laughs> then ultimately it's got to be Tesla as my vehicle. So the Batmobile is a Tesla. So I got, but you know, in the interest of fairness, I got to keep that same energy tonight. All right. So let's start off with, you know, AMD. Cause a lot of folks, you know, they got, you know, they got significantly tested just to see if their shells weren't hard boiled or not, just to see, okay, hey, can you stick can you stick with the, the position and stay the course with AMD? So let's let's take a look at that, shall we? Mm -hmm. All right. So here is the financial results for first quarter for 2021 for AMD reported today, which they announced revenue uh, for the first quarter of 2021 at 3.4 billion, operating income at 662 million. Net income, so pretty much net after everything has been essentially expensed for. Then you're looking at 555 million in diluted earnings per share of uh, 0.45. All right, so on a and that's on a non-GAAP basis. Uh, operating income of 762, net income at 642, and diluted earnings per share at 0.52. So here's the thing: a lot of folks wanted to know, like, okay, hey, Mark, what does this mean by GAAP? versus non-GAAP. So GAAP means pretty much generally accepted accounting principles. So it's pretty much something which is universal that ultimately that the SEC looks at and it's something that, you know, honestly, every company should be reporting. And on top of that, I think it's been done since 1931. And then of course you have non-GAAP, which goes a little bit more lax as you can see in the data. Essentially, it's like, you know, pretty much the most trusted is of course GAAP. All right. So if we look at it, just purely from a simple standpoint, as I've just read, you can see how AMD has done in revenue quarter over quarter from year over year. They're up 93% in revenue. Like, just let that sink in for a second. Quarter one of last year, before like the COVID-19, like before the pandemic really took some significant legs onto into the global economy, AMD had reported $1.7 billion as it pertains to revenue. And just imagine what 12 months can do. Now they're at $3.4 billion. If you think about it from, you know, for example, their gross profit, their gross profit, 1.5 billion in comparison to last year's uh, Q1, uh, it's up 94%. Now, of course, gross margins have been pretty much flat. So you're pretty much at getting to a point where you're talking about the law of large numbers. Of course, I'm probably sure that where we get to the perspective, I'm probably guessing by next quarter, we'll probably see AMD at a profit margin of about 47 or 46.9% profit margin. So, but my guess is probably at 47%. Um, operating expenses, as you can see with the revenue, they've also increased their expenses as well. So the expenses have gone up 45%. And I'm probably guessing that just because of the fact that with the, with the face of demand, with also ramp up as it pertains to product, also with chip shortages, as well as dealing with your partners, you have to kind of like do this dance. Uh, in some cases, you got to pay some suppliers a little bit more, just so that way you can keep that preferential treatment. And thus, we can see that happening. But at the same token, operating income, though, is up 274%. So, I mean, this pretty much reads like a thing of beauty. So let's get into it a little bit. Like I always love, like I always tell people, I like to read like, you know, sometimes just the, just the results of things. Now, of course, we've already talked about revenue, gross margin, and essentially being flat. Now, they said the quarter over quarter increase was driven by a greater mix of Ryzen, Radeon, and Epic processor sales. So if you don't know, let, let Cousin Mark break it down for you. Ryzen is the consumer side of the chips. We know that it's like pretty much your gamers or your basic users as it pertains to like on the consumer side. 
Then on top of that, you have Radeon, which is their graphics card unit. So pretty much anything graphics card, that's Radeon. So they have once bought out a company by the name of ATI, which they had ATI Radeon. And then pretty much now it's just Radeon. They dropped ATI, which thank God. And then on top of that, they have this processor called Epic. Now, let's turn you back in time a little bit, shall we, Jolyn? Mm -hmm. And I need to come off screen for this because, you know, the shade is coming, though, that I ain't got my shades for some reason. I don't know what's going on. Where are they? You know, it's been a long weekend and everything else. I'm a little bit refreshed. As you can see, my chi is up. My energy is there. So, you know, probably don't need it. This is Mark straight to you. No chaser. Now, remember, if you go back to Intel's earnings, Hello. Now, Intel's earnings have reported a 20% drop <laughs> as it retains to their server chips. Hmm. Now, for anybody that doesn't know product, I want you to look up the word EPYC following after the, those three letters of AMD. Now, that's going to tell you something is going to be very, very telling. And I'll just go ahead and give you like five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. All right. So if you haven't searched it yet, okay, spoiler alert. Epic is their server processors, which, by the way, is also built on an ARM framework. Anyways, so that's their, that's their server of chips, which is ultimately beating out every single Intel server chip on the market not only in performance but also in price i think like intel's server chip their best one is actually ranked dead last in 21st place and the other 20 processors that sit ahead of it yeah you guessed it they're amd chips and they're either yeah, pretty much somewhere in this mix so that kind of like was very very telling to the market to say, okay, hey, now we understand where that 20% drop came from as it pertains to Intel's revenue. Now, of course, drop in, say, for example, Intel's revenue in 20% reads something a little bit different. And if you kind of like come back up, you can kind of start to see it where, okay, hey, now these things start to make a little bit of sense. And remember what I said, I, I could have sworn I was telling people that don't be surprised if you see a 20% drop in earnings per share year over year by Intel. Well, here we have it, earnings per share for AMD up 189%. Yeah, just wanted to put that out there. Okay. All right. So a lot of this is like, you know, the pretty much basic stuff. Like, for example, like, you know, you can read any simple balance sheet that's up above. So that's great. Now let's get into some of the weeds, shall we? Where we talk about the segments. So computing and graphics revenue was 2.10, 2.1 billion. So pretty much 46% year over year. As we said, client processor average selling price grew year over year and quarter over quarter. So pretty much they're growing not only on the desktop, not only on the desktop platforms, but also notebook processors. I'll tie it in for you. You know, Microsoft also made an announcement saying that, hey, we're going to give our consumers now choices of whether or not they want Intel or AMD preferences when it comes to their Surface Pro lineup. Now that's huge because if you look at all the Surface Pro lineups way before, it was all Intel. So that lets you know that the ground is shifting a little bit. Now, of course, GPU, uh, was, GPU was also higher year over year with their Radeon graphics products. But you know, if you look at it across the board, Intel doesn't sell that. So that's neither here nor there. Now you're competing against uh, NVIDIA. And both of those companies are pretty much just struggling just to keep things on the shelf. I mean, hell, you even have, you know, country, you even have folks that are smuggling things on boats, like just to get them to their country. So it's like, it just puts everything into perspective. Now, here's where we get into the weeds of everything, where we talk about enterprise and their embedded semi-custom revenue. Now, for anybody that knows AMD, it's no secret that if you think about your PlayStation 5s or your Xboxes, then that's pretty much coming through on, say, for example, your SOS or your, your embedded semi-custom chips from AMD. We know that they supply that. That's the RDNA architecture. So if you're enjoying gaming on those devices, congratulations. You're getting about 10 ter teraflops or of just awesomeness and graphical power. Now, but here's this other part, that enterprise though, and this is where that Epic processor revenue is really starting to sink in. Quarter over quarter increase was driven by higher Epic processor sales, partially offset by lower semi-custom product sales. Now, let's run that back, shall we? So which is letting you know there's a huge chip supply, chip supply shortage 
of, say, for example, gaming devices. Now, AMD just can't keep PS5s and Microsoft Series X devices on the shelves, but they have been able to keep those Epic processors, processors still flowing to the enterprise market because, of course, a lot of your enterprise customers that especially do data centers and deal with the cloud, that's where that chip ultimately powers it. So even us talking to you right now through Zoom, going into YouTube, through Google, and then on top of that, whatever cloud infrastructures that you may use, you guessed it, it's probably powered either by Intel or it's now starting to be powered by AMD's Epic processors. Something to be said there. And that's pretty much kind of like the ball game for AMD versus, versus Intel. Now, not against NVIDIA because NVIDIA is coming through with some serious fire. But, you know, that's a whole nother story. We'll save that. We'll save that battle for another day. So some simple highlights, as you can see, uh, their processors included for Epic was the world's highest performance server processor and pretty much the entire series lineup has just literally just been killing it, including Microsoft Azure using the service, Oracle, Tencent Cloud, Amazon AWS, Google Cloud. I mean, honestly, if I'm Intel, I'm nervous right now. I'm really, really nervous. And word on my street, Jolene? Mm. What's the word? That Zen 4 processor that's coming out? That Zen 4, like that Zen 4 series? Word on the street is that you may be talking about two nanometer chips in the not so distant future. Two? Just saying. Okay, now. Now, the reason why the, that's crucial is you need to go back and find out what Pat CEO of Intel had said about by 2023, we'll be ready to produce this. Well, if you're doing this by 2023, and I remember mentioning this, I said, well, where will your competition be? Exactly. So, I mean, if exactly. So now we're starting to see like, and by the way, for anybody that needs to know exactly what HP stands for, it's high bandwidth version three, and then VMs means virtual machines. So, of course, you know, now you have server chips tied with AMD Instinct GPUs. I mean, clearly, look at what they're doing in places like, you know, Sweden, uh, as it pertains to them producing supercomputers. And then on top of that, with systems like Microsoft Azure, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And then AMD customers are on track to increase the number of notebooks based on their five series of Ryzen. Um, I mean, honestly... I'm trying not to really sound like a fanboy here. So honestly, I'm trying to be as, I'm really trying to be as objective as I possibly can. And uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. What? The news is the news is just too good. Like the news was just too good. And the thing is, I told everybody from day one, when people were starting to doubt this company, I said, yo, hold, chill out let the company go through this process of reshuffling, which we're seeing across the entire market. And here we are. I always, I did say that you'll get a nice little pop early on in the year, but then wait for some of the news to come out. Now, mind you, this is an AMD's best quarter, just as a heads up. Mm -hmm. And Lisa Sue kind of pointed that out during the earnings call. This isn't their best of quarters. It's a good quarter. It's a phenomenal quarter. But this is also them dealing with a chip supply shortage across the entire industry. This is also letting you know that there's a ton of pent up demand going from 2022 all the way to 2023. So this is going to go beyond not just 2021, but the road to 2022 and the road to 2023. Whew. Good luck. So they said for the full year of 2021, AMD now expects revenue growth of approximately 50% over 2020, driven by growth in all businesses up from prior guidance of approximately 37% annual growth. So in their last earnings, they had expected about 37% annual growth. Well, they just now boosted that. Now, what's going to happen there? Here's my guess. Don't be surprised if you see AMD kind of like raise a little bit of its prices and maybe get a little bit more efficient on its expenses side. So where they drop expenses, operating expenses, and then ultimately increase sale price. So then that way you can probably get a small little boost here and there. It's not going to be anything super duper significant, but at the same token, you know, 
hey, there it is. And that's really the game when it comes to AMD, when we look at it in perspective. So for all folks out there that literally, you know, stuck to the script, congratulations. Today, it's your day and it's just getting started for AMD. Yeah, listening to the earnings call um, earlier today, it was just one of those things where it was like, okay, so I see that they've been, they've been, they've been working and also they will be, there's more opportunity for profit. Like they, they're just, they're showing that there's going to be more opportunity for, uh, for profit. And that's what they talked about um, in their guidance. And they didn't use those exact words. Um, but Dr. Lisa Sue, she was just very um, straightforward and pretty much kept everything in mind, um, including just like you were talking about, like the chip shortage and everything. And that's nice to have that that context and still be able to flex like yeah there's a shortage and we're also going to still be making money so could you imagine if there wasn't a shortage i would say if there wasn't a shortage then that would have like here's the thing not having a shortage in the market mm -hmm. that would have caused significant problems even further for intel because of the fact that if you didn't have a chip chip supply shortage this is this chip supply shortage is giving Intel a chance to ultimately ramp up its production. The problem is, is that Intel is so stuck in its way as it retains to its design because they have their own foundry, unlike AMD, which has to go through TSM. You know, you're thinking about let's get to seven nanometer or five nanometer or whatever it is, but they're working on let's get to three, let's get to two. And so when we think about it, like everybody's like wondering why do the nanometers can't matter? Because the goal is for all chip companies to become more power efficient, more efficient devices as it pertains to power performance. And ultimately, I mean, honestly, when you get to that point also, you can also get a little bit better as it pertains to price as well. So I feel bad for Intel because of the fact that this should be an area in which that, okay, hey, this is an, a place where you take a breath. But unfortunately, like I said, you've got an industry that is completely shifting and that is starting to catch up. And it's like, you wrote the standard and now essentially that standard is no more and it's, it's producing problems. Well, so, I mean, if I was Intel, I would definitely feel some type of way about Microsoft saying, well, you know, we're going to let the consumers choose either AMD or Intel when yeah. they had the game like on lock and they mm -hmm. could have kept innovating and they didn't. And so, man, I would just be feeling so salty. I don't, I don't, I don't know what to tell them. Like, let's move on. Yeah. All right. So up next, we We've got, got Alphabet. Alphabet. Mm -hmm. Now, so a lot of folks have been wondering, like, Mark, why does they call it Alphabet? Like, what's the purpose of them calling it Alphabet? Well, I mean, if you think about it, Google had acquired a lot of companies through either Google Ventures or through just Google. And essentially what they did was they just said, okay, hey, we'll create the parent company, which is known as Alphabet, since we have all these assets. And pretty much it's pretty much if you think about Google and all of its acquisitions and all the companies that are that work within it, the letters start from A to Z. <laughs> and thus we have Alphabet. So um, let's get into these earnings though. So essentially it's like, you know, Alph Alphabet has an interesting fill as it pertains to their, their earnings, but pretty much, you know, total revenues was at 55.3 billion in the first quarter. Yeah. 55.3 billion reflects elevated consumer activity, online and broad based growth and advertiser revenue. Now here's the thing to in be interesting in. Has anybody else noticed that we started to see more travel and leisure advertisements start to pop up? Mm. Now, here's the interesting thing about travel and leisure. They're one of the most heaviest when it comes to the advertisement spend. So that's letting you know that they're trying to ramp up as it pertains to travel. Now, the second most, I think the second most advertised is probably automotive. So they spend a heavy duty amount of advertisement spend when it comes to automotive commercials and, and whatnot. So 
it wouldn't be shocking if you see these things and ultimately they were heavy spenders during that time period. It would be interesting to watch exactly how much did Ford or GM spend when they report their earnings when it comes to marketing budget. So they said, we're very pleased with Momentum in Google Cloud with revenues of $4 billion in the quarter, reflecting strength and opportunity in both uh, GCP, Google Cloud, and Workspace. All right, so here are the revenues as it breaks down, and I'm seeing this all off of the top of the dome for each and every single one of you just downloaded it. So we're going to decipher this together. So the revenues, ultimately, they see that there was an increase of 34% uh, year over year, increase in constant currency year over year is at 32%. All right, so um, let's see, operating income. So essentially, they've they've significantly uh, grown at about 30% year over year. So that's kind of cool uh, as it pertains to what they did. It's not very detailed in this in this one that I've downloaded, but let's get to the, the traffic acquisition costs and number. And, and I guess they do a revenue traffic acquisition. So costs, which is TAC and number of employees. So pretty much, and this is, I think this is listed in the billions just as a heads up because we're in the millions. And so a lot of folks are like, well, Mark, like how does this read? So that's 6 billion in YouTube ads. Uh, 6.8 billion in Google network. So all in all, when you think about Google search, that's 31 billion or 31.8. So 44.6 billion versus uh, 33.7 billion in Google advertisement. I mean, of course they have the Google cloud, which is, we already said 4 billion versus 2.7 last year. And that's greatly in part due to the fact that since a lot of folks are, are socially distant still, still at home. And then of course they're improving their infrastructure for when there's going to be this hybrid model of people being at home and also being at the office space. I'm probably sure that these revenues should essentially hold, of course, give or take plus or minus about a hundred million. I'm probably guessing, um, for, you know, for every, I mean, I guess for every 1%, so to speak. Um, so then we also have hedging, uh, hedging gains and losses. This is a pretty, pretty interesting thing because here they had a gain of 49 uh, million, but then here they had a loss here of a 109. So it's interesting to find out what is it that they could possibly be hedging um, on. So, because they're saying that they're making some significant bets and I'm probably sure that that still follows suit within their Google X uh, division where they like to work on things and research and development and then ultimately unveil them later. So we could probably be seeing that at Google IO where they make an announcement of a project that they've been working on. Uh, they tend to do that. Um, so typically when you see other bets, that's typically a section where they normally take losses in this area because it's just all R and D. Um, so when we look at it, total income from operations, again, 16.4 billion. Uh, versus 7.9 billion in last year. So, so now they the biggest thing that stole the show was the 50 billion dollars uh, of its Class C capital stock. Now, for anybody that doesn't know about Google, Google actually has two tickers. One is GOOG, and then the other one happens to be GOOGL on the stock market. And so, ultimately, you also see that in the S&P 500. So, Google is one of the very few companies where it has two tickers. And the S and P 500, if not the only one, and essentially what you do is you just put those two together, and then that equals a percentage, which I would probably say you know pretty much rivals that of Microsoft and Apple. Mm -hmm. um, so repurchases are expected to be executed from time to time. So pretty much over a period of time, I'm probably guessing either through the quarter or over the year, they'll probably uh, my guess is the year they'll purchase about 50 billion. So anytime when you see Google drop, we've seen this happen with companies like Apple where you see significant drops in the stock price, what will happen is, is that pretty much Google will, or Alphabet will buy the stock because of the fact that they're buying at a low. So then of course, uh, then they had their teleconference. So forward looking statements is pretty much all the simplistic stuff, but not very much stuff here. But if we look at it at, on the balance sheet, I mean, if you look at it, I mean, they're pretty much concurrent with where they are in this quarter. Of course, this is unaudited versus this one being audited, but pretty much showing you the growth there. Um, let's see, any contingencies here? Nothing really um, outside of just, you know, certain stock being paid out over periods of time as it pertains to stockholders, probably just issuances of stock for its executives. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, accrued compensation and benefits, about 30.7 billion. So those are their liabilities. Long-term debt, I mean, 
laughable um, because it's really <laughs> nothing. And, and, and so here's the thing when we look at it for when we look at like, you know, for example, cash, you got to look at it as it pertains to cash and cash equivalents is at 26.6 billion. So total cash, cash equivalents or marketable securities equals about 135 billion. Um, and then at the same token, so that could easily dwarf, which means that they could pay off the debt with no issues, none whatsoever. So essentially, I mean, Google is quite the healthy company. So when we look at it as it pertains to total liabilities and stockholders equity, that's about $327 billion. So not bad. Um, again, if you want to get even further into the weeds, it's pretty much the same thing, like the cost of their revenue. So what does it cost in order to make that money? It's about 24.1, um, but their revenues was at 50, 55. So putting it into perspective, essentially, you know, again, solid quarter, solid beat. Look at the, look at the range from 2020 versus where we are in 2021. Um, no complaints, none whatsoever. Their earnings reads like a thing of beauty. So congratulations to Alphabet fantastic beat on the top and the bottom line and the, uh, the interesting thing that stole the show also was really that earnings per share if you think about it which was about 9.96 uh, or if we look at it on a diluted basis 9.87 but we'll go with 9.96 on the non-dilution and their beat for 2021 was pretty much set at 26.63 so that's just a monster beat. And so again, congratulations to the folks whom which that are in Google. So if you're trading anything that's spy related, then you'll, you'll probably kind of like have a pretty interesting day. Um, also, you know, fantastic job if you're in XLC or some of the other ETFs out there, if you wanted a little bit less smoke, but if you're in the actual stock itself or in the actual option itself, singularly, um, congratulations, kudos to you. Um, I'm seeing a comment about some frustration. Um, someone said that they get a little frustrated because a lot of these tech companies do good as far as their earnings, but the stock price doesn't reflect that. Yeah, so you see that from time to time. I mean, you know, so the thing about it is, is that, you know, you'll have, you'll have some companies that have huge run-ups going into earnings. But then you also have, and this is going to play into my next role in which I'm talking about from like, you have to remember a lot of these firms have clients in whom which they probably want to take profit or probably want to have a rebalancing because they wanted to get a little bit more defensive, not having an idea of what the further outlook for the market looked like or, you know, what their potential risk exposure was. So you saw a huge rebalancing and that took place earlier in this year, which we just came out of. And then essentially now we're going into a place where the market is, I would probably say, probably rebalanced and pretty balanced out at this point in time. And now we're starting a new bull market run because of the fact that the growth is starting to show that economic growth is starting to show you that we're starting to pick up things and go a little bit further as it pertains to, you know, the economy's getting better. So with that being said, it's like, you're going to see these drops and especially like you see these drops early on in presidencies when you see changeovers in, in polit politics. Also, when you start seeing new legislation come out. So things get a little bit choppy. But when you look at it in the grand scheme of things, if you zoom out from like, say, for example, the last 60 days, then you really start to see like really what the perspective is. And that's where I always say, look at the one year, two year or five year where you can really put things into full perspective to actually see, okay, hey, where is it that we're still going? The bull market run for a lot of these tech companies are doing just fine. Of course, we've seen some rebalancing also, not only within the stock market, within the stock side, but also within the options uh, chains or within the options market. But it doesn't mean that there's not opportunities there. So if you want to, you can also rebalance your, your options portfolio into, say, for example, the same position, but maybe finding different types of strikes or different dates in which that you can rebalance it out to. I mean, it's just that type of a game where it's like now it's like you have somebody else, which is an opponent that's staring you, staring at you from across the pond. You know, like the good old quote says, a fisherman sees another fisherman from afar. And so now it's like it's 2020 was where everybody on this side went fishing. And it's like, yo, the other side, they ain't fishing. Like, yo, let's go get this fish. 
Now it's totally different because now you have to strategize. You have to pick your spots. You have to figure out, okay, hey, this is where I want to get in. This is where I want to kind of like, okay, the risk is a little bit too hot for me. And then just wait. Um, that's the beauty of it. Um, but at the same token, are these companies damaged by any sense, form or fashion? No, because they wouldn't be, if they were damaged and they wouldn't put up these type of numbers. And I think that ultimately you have to take this into consideration when we get to wall street. Um, a lot of these companies had phenomenal earnings. Even the company that I'm going to get into in a little bit, they had a phenomenal quarter, but also at the same token, it's like now people are starting, you have value investors, you have value based analysts out there that are on wall street that are saying, Hey, is this too expensive? Now, how do we judge these companies? If you're a value investor, then you're going to look at all the, you're going to look at the balance sheet. You're going to look at the 10 Qs. You're going to look at everything from purely from a pure, you know, accounting perspective and say, okay, Hey, this is how I put it together. Look at PE ratios. If you're a value investor. Now, if you're a value investor, then you're not going to be looking at anything above a 35 PE ratio. So a Amazon, Apple, all these other companies are outside of your peer review. But if you are focused on the growth, and if you think about it, growth stocks typically look at things from a five to 10 year basis. So if we look at it like that, and if you're thinking about growth stock companies, then yeah, you, the beautiful thing about growth stocks are they grow. Their stocks actually go on great runs, but yet at the same token, that's all. there's a flip side to that coin because when they're not as loved or say, for example, when there's not that much interest, then ultimately they tend to waver or they can hurt a little bit. But in the grand scheme of things, that's the price that we pay for greatness. And honestly, like I said, you saw it with Microsoft blockbuster earnings and you saw it early on last quarter with Apple where they reported blockbuster earnings and their stocks took dips. But in the grand scheme of things, I'm probably sure that I wouldn't be surprised if Apple doesn't, it doesn't shock the world and say, hey, we're going to do a 50 or $100 billion uh, stock purchase buyback and you're going to start seeing other companies follow suit. So honestly, I mean, not worried, none whatsoever. <laughs> All right, let's get into scale bail, whatever. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about it. So Tesla came out with a phenomenal quarter, just like I had just talked about from like many, like your AMDs, like your, you know, your Googles or Alphabets, your Microsofts, um, mm -hmm. phenomenal quarter, just, you know, killed it. Now, was it like phenomenal, phenomenal? Did it, did it meet the whisper number of Wall Street? I don't think so, because I think that was probably about a dollar, a dollar 15. Um, but it was still a decent, good quarter, given all the things in which that they have had to deal with. Here's the problem, and this is where really where things started to kind of fall apart for Tesla, which each and every single one of you saw today. Now, is this like a long-term problem? No. Is it something short-term? Yes. But here's how Wall Street sees it. Wall Street sees it from a simple way of like, and that's where, if you notice, Elon mentioned what kind of company Tesla is during his earnings call. He said, hey, we focus on artificial intelligence and hardware. So we're software and hardware. Mm -hmm. And that's all great. But then there's some problems for the folks in whom wish that struggle to understand. If we think about what Tesla is, it's like, you know, think about it. When you look at any earnings call for Tesla, what is the thing that we always look at for Tesla? What was its delivery numbers? That's the reason why everybody puts so much emphasis towards Tesla. It's delivery numbers. And here's the reason why. It's kind of hard to look at Tesla when we think about it from the sense of software. Why? Because you don't have that many, you're not licensing out the software yet, to my knowledge. You're not licensing it out yet because it's incomplete. It's not done yet. So Wall Street looks at that and says, okay, if I'm playing a game of spades, let's play, let's all play a game of spades here. We're all sitting here at the cookout. And so normally when you play a game of spades, when you have a hand, when you have something in your hand, which you know that can actually beat the hand, then ultimately you call that, okay, hey, that's a book. Like, hands down, this is a book. Now, if you have something in which that is possible, but you don't know if it can fully fly, depending on who your opponents are, the other players at the table, then you call that a possible. Now, here's the thing. Let's look at it from Tesla. Tesla, when we look at its vehicles, second to none, most likely, we're going to call that probably a spade in the tan. It's definitely a book. 
When we look at its energy sector, it's getting started. It's a strong possible. When we look at it as it pertains to a software business, it's a possible. When we look at, say, for example, you know, other things within Tesla's ecosystem, those are all possibles. Now, let's go to the flip side to see how Wall Street looks at this company. Now, if you're playing Joker, Joker, Deuce, Deuce, or, you know, or Ace High, that's, you know, that's up to you. And that's between you and the God, you and the God that you serve. All right. So, but if we're looking at it from a simple perspective of what's in your hand, here's how Wall Street looks at, say, for example, if you zoom out of, say, for example, Tesla's hand and go look at, say, for example, the other players. Remember this. Tesla has Model X, Model S, which are delayed. Model 3, Model Y are doing good. China, there's some issues there, but yet at the same token, that won't, you know, in the grand scheme of things, that won't mean anything. And we know that they're going to continue to keep ramping up manufacturing. So that's dope. And we realize that their profit margins of what they bring in for their vehicles are competing against, say, for example, your GMs, your Fords, and stuff like that. When you look at the revenue, hey, wow, they're bringing in significant revenue, but they didn't have to sell as many cars, kind of like the Apple and Samsung debate that we talked about a year ago, but I digress. So now let's look into the hand of, let's say, GM. Well, GM is a, considered a company that has further longevity. Another thing that, like, for example, when they say that they're going to release something, they release it. When they tell you that they're going to do something, they do it. Now, the problem with Elon Musk that a lot of folks have with Elon is the fact that, hey, he says he's going to release something. And the next thing you know, it's delayed by a year or two years. For example, the Roadster 2 was unveiled two years ago. And yet people haven't received it yet. Not going to say who, but people haven't received it yet. It hasn't even gone into a full-fledged production. Now, of course, you can blame that on a few other things, but the fact still remains, you told the consumers that essentially that it would be here and it's not here. Same thing goes for the semi. Now, the question is, people are kind of like, mm, can the same thing happen for, let's say, the Cybertruck? Now, one thing that we can say is, when Tesla delivers a product, then ultimately, hey, it's, it's a smash hit. It's kind of hard to keep up with it. But here's how Wall Street sees it. When GM releases something, when they say 2025 that their entire fleet will be there, where they'll have 30 vehicles, all electric, you can most likely take that to the bank because of the fact that they can do it. Now, here's where we look at it as a possible versus it being a spade. Well, let's look at it like this from a simple perspective. You have to do all this ramping up. You have to change, say, for example, some of your manufacturing. Your costs are going to go high. So then that kind of turns it into a possible. But at the same token, you have infrastructure. You also have licensing. You also have partners. And then on top of that, you have sales. That essentially that we're talking about millions. Of, we're talking about millions of vehicles that go out. OK, now it's just a matter of you improving your profit margins. Can you do that? You're stepping into an entirely new space. Can they do that? Now they're also going into other arenas where they're going into the technology where they could potentially license that out to other players. There's possibility there. So when you start putting everything into perspective as it pertains to how is it that it's played, now the question is when you're sitting out, if you're the person that's not playing a hand and you're sitting there as Wall Street, you see Tesla's hand and you see, say, for example, the other auto manufacturers, whether it's Ford, GM, and we'll even say Daimler in there. So now it's like, okay, hey, who you got? Because now you got to look at the services and the products that are out, actually out there. If you know that GM is releasing, you know that essentially that they're going to release products and they're going to just flood the entire market with it. Same thing as Ford. If you look at Tesla, it's like they make it to order. So essentially it goes direct to consumer, which is great. And you have services that are tied around it. You're building the moat. The problem is the boat is not complete. The moat is not complete. You're doing a very, very good job as it pertains to doing it. But yet at the same token. Mm. And so that's when you think and when you start to look at and then on top of that, you're trading at the Tesla's trading at this higher multiple versus it's making the other stocks, the other companies look significantly cheaper. So now if you're the institutional investor, you're sitting there saying, OK, hey, do I want the growth where I can get this high performance or do I want a little bit of performance as it pertains to stock and then also collect a nice dividend, which is safer, less risk. See, that's the thing that you also have to tie into it when it comes to strategizing your hand. The question is, is that, OK, hey, is it safer for me to play Tesla or is it safer for my money when it comes to Ford GM? Now, of course, 
if you're looking towards the future, then honestly, you can, we already know how this, we already know how the story ends. Many of you have already been shown the finish line. You're just walking it back and just walking through some of the reruns. But outside of that, I mean, honestly, most investors look at what's in front of them today. And then they use what the information in which that they have, and they use the tangible evidence that they have in front of them to give them project to look towards projections moving forward. But yet at the same token, it's like, it's hard to do that when you have a lot of things that say, for example, Tesla is struggling. Now to Tesla's credit, Tesla spends zero money when it comes to advertising and marketing, as well as PR. Some will say that that's a good thing. Some will say that that could possibly be a liability. The question is, is that, okay, hey, when you look at it from GM, Ford, and everything else, they got a PR department. Yes, they spend money as it pertains to advertisement and marketing. And as you can see, Ford is still the top selling truck in the United States. Now, Tesla, Elon Musk made this very, very bold claim by saying that by 2022 or 2023, that the Model Y will probably be the best selling vehicle. Now, he's a very, very smart dude. The problem is, is that just because he's a very, very smart dude doesn't mean that the rest of the world understands his greatness. And that's the point. Like, for example, when you look at the folks in which that are significant thought leaders within communities and spaces, you have to put it into perspective that the world doesn't always see what genius sees. And, and that's where that S curve comes in. That's where the S curve comes into play. And where it really comes down to, and so really the thing that killed Tesla was the fact that the only thing that killed Tesla was the fact that, hey, you didn't provide delivery numbers. You gave them a trajectory as it pertains to 50%. Now, here's a funny thing. Tesla gave 50%, AMD gave 50% growth <laughs> uh, expectations mm -hmm. within their guidance, which is very, very interesting. But it's funny because of the fact that it's like when you really put it into perspective, it's like, okay, hey, they want a number. Like when we look at it, let's go through some, let's go through some quick cards here, shall we? When you look at Tesla, you look at the vehicle sold. You haven't, you're not able to look at the energy yet because why? They haven't been able to solve exactly like they have the technology, they have the product, but then how does it get installed? They haven't figured out that they haven't been able to like, they, they're figuring that out and I'm probably sure they're going to figure it out and they're going to dominate once they get it ready, but it's not there yet. Take this into consideration. Tesla bought Solar City for $4 billion back in, I think, 2014 or 2016. I think it's 2016. Here we sit in 2021. Does a solar division produce $4 billion in revenue today? Probably not. So essentially, that's, that's really the challenge. So when we look at it and moving forward, there's a lot of challenges while Tesla is building the moat versus the institutional money looking at, okay, these companies already have a moat. They already have a structure. Now, the problem is with that is they have a structure, but where's the growth? Is it really there? Are they really going to take a, that much significant market share from Tesla or is Tesla just going to keep going? It's like a, it's like a structure that builds to the edge of the cliff. And, and if you're standing from a distance, all you can see is, okay, I can get from point A to point B, but Tesla is the company that's building the structure that's going to span over the cliff. And right. if you get in early, you will reap the benefit on the other side. That is but correct. If you get in with, um, with like GM or, you know, the automakers now and where, where they're going, especially if you're thinking about this, as you described, like as the institutional investor, it's only going to take you so far. Right. So the question then becomes for yourself as a cousin, what, what's your invest investor perspective? Correct. Are you looking long-term in the future or are you looking more uh, short-term and myopic? If you are, then I mean, I mean, do you, you, but over here, I'm sticking to. Well, it's tough, Joanne, and I know that we're going a little bit over and I'm sorry, but I feel like this is really, really crucial for the cousins to really grasp here. So it's tough. And here's the reason why it's tough for the cousins. 
Mm -hmm. Because on one side, you have institutional money that's purely focused on, hey, I've got to beat this benchmark called the S&P 500 every quarter. I got to also stay on target every month, probably some in some cases in some shops on a weekly basis or a bi-weekly basis. I got to stay ahead of the S&P 500 because that's ultimately how my job is judged based upon that benchmark. So if I have to look at it and I have to also make sure that I'm not losing the firm money, I have to ask myself, which one is it that I go for? Now, if you think about it from a simple perspective, now, a lot of these institutions, they may have money within Tesla. No shade, none whatsoever. They have no shade, no animosity towards Tesla, none whatsoever. The problem, the problem with Tesla is, is the fact that, hey, will Tesla consistently beat the S&P 500 every year? That's ultimately what they're looking at. If you look at Apple, Apple typically can, for the most part, beat the S&P 500 every year. AMD has been literally wiping the floor with the S&P 500. If you go back and look at those percentages of the S&P 500 versus, say, for example, um, AMD, NVIDIA, um, also, if you look at some of the ETFs out there, I mean, but Tesla hasn't always done that. Now, I believe that Tesla is now a company that has stepped into its prime, but yet at the same token, there are challenges that Tesla must get over. Now, will they get over it? Yes. But when you look at institutional money, they say, okay, hey, is it now? Is it today? Are these issues going to be resolved today? Can I, can I actually feel confident and comfortable in, in, in investing my client's money today to essentially make this trade? Now, in some cases, when they want to go risk on, don't be surprised when you see that Tesla is a high flyer, which I believe that, that you'll see that in the near future. But when it comes to, like, say, for example, in, the, in those moments where the game gets a little bit tough and when it gets a little tight and slows down, then ultimately they're not going to throw their money towards a Tesla. They're going to throw their money towards the things in which that they know. It's kind of like trust the devil you know versus the devil that you don't know. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things that they don't know about Tesla. There's still folks that think that Tesla is purely an automobile company when you can look at Tesla from all different forms. And that's the point. It's like they don't understand in this. They understand the company. But the question is, do they understand the company for what it is now versus what it, what it will be later on? See, but that's when the PR part, like that's when you start to think, hmm, maybe they could benefit from some PR um, as far as, oh my gosh, my iPad died. Sad times. Um, as far as like benefiting um, that aspect of their company, like allowing others that, especially institutional money to understand what it is that they are investing in. Like that goes back to the ability to enroll people in your vision. If you can't do that and you're out here doing something big, you will be alone. Like, so it's, you gotta, it's like, you get to be the visionary, you get to execute that vision, but then you also get to enroll people in the vision so they can see it too. But if that arm's not there, Mark. Well, I mean, simple thing like this, and I'll explain it from my side of the world. Mm -hmm. For those that know me, I'm a venture capitalist, which means that when we make investments, if I drop anywhere from quarter of a million to roughly two and a half million dollars on an investment for a startup. So essentially those bets are made over, say, for example, me thinking like, okay, hey, this is at least a solid five years out mm -hmm. of an investment that I'm making on a company. It's a lot different on Wall Street because of the fact that it's totally different. You know, most likely you're either investing into a company for it to later become acquired or for it to one day go ring the bell in the NASDAQ or the Russell, whatever they're going to do. Hopefully, God forbid, not goes back. But then you also have, say, for example, this other portion of investors that are like, OK, hey, we don't have time for that because of the fact that we're dealing with clients money. They don't have five years. What they're looking their clients, their consumers at these investment places want return and they significantly want a return and if you can't produce that then that poses a problem so i mean that's the way that people got to look at it now if you're playing the options market that's why i always said don't give seasonal don't give seasonal trades lifetime expectations you know the fundamental analysis of tesla you know the journey and where it's going the world can see it it's very evident it's obvious 
Tesla could be a $1 trillion company before 2021 is over. I strongly believe that. The problem is, is the fact that there's going to be times in the road in which that you're going to go through these tough times with this company called Tesla. That's the price that you pay. People that were early stage Apple investors, they understand what I'm talking about because early in those days, that's the price that you paid for greatness with Steve Jobs. He didn't always have a hit. And ultimately, it led to also partly his demise of him being booted out of Apple and then later coming back when he had a little bit more swag. But either that, either way, it's like, you know, that's the way that you got to look at it from a simple perspective. It's like, okay, hey, if you're in Tesla, you're either like if you're trading Tesla, you got to understand like, okay, hey, what are the catalysts for this time period now? And does it fit? Versus applying a five-year strategy on a one-year trade is not going to work. It's not going to work. It's going to work because there are some, I know there's some cousins that are thinking like that. You know, there was um, some, I was talking to one of the OG cousins. There was some concern about um, newer cousins, you know, losing money, um, like not fully understanding what was going on, but yet still entering the market probably has to do with, you know, FOMO, which we've already talked about 80 mm -hmm. million times. FOMO is not a strategy. Um, and I think like, well, if you can distill it down, like what were the top three lessons, like from, as an investor that you learned or that you think the cousin should really um, focus on um, from this first quarter, especially like coming out of the pandemic you know, low key, and then being on the uptrend for this v sure. shape recovery. Sure. Uh, first things first, you know, you got to let the euphoria go. You got to take the emotions and everything out of it. And then essentially now you got to start being more, you got to be more strategic. Again, last year was completely different. I mean, of course, it produced a great opportunity for many folks to step within the market. But now there's also another player that stepped into the market alongside with you. And you need to understand what the room looks like. I'll look at it from a simple a game of chess. So that way I can understand. I can break it down in three parts. The board. The board is the market. Tons of opportunity. Tons of, tons of moves to be made within the market. There's your side of the board. And there's their side of the board. Both sides are going for the win. And then sometimes you're going to compete against institutional money or you're gonna compete against other players out there. Now, the thing is, when, you have, when you're playing any game of chess, you gotta have a strategy, AKA, you gotta have a trading plan. It, it, I think that if anything, when people get emotional, it goes to show you that essentially that many times they don't have a trading plan, which means that essentially that's just walking into a battle or into a war without a sword, just off top. So the first thing that you can learn from this quarter is realize there's another player in the room and they're much bigger. And essentially it's like, yo, they're not caring about retail investors. They're caring more so about their institutional clients. That's who they're serving. And their focus is their measure based upon the S&P 500 as a benchmark. That's the first thing. The second thing that you got to learn is, again, you got to come up with a very strong thesis that not only just supports your your point because you can make any you can bring any set of facts to literally pr make a point but know just as much as you know your thesis for the bull side know your thesis as it pertains to the bear side because it gives you that deep sense of humility that lets you know hey this can screw up and understanding also that the fact that 2020 is over and now that we are back into the normalcy of things understanding that okay hey that things are going to move a little bit slower. Things are going to move a little bit slower. And ultimately, you're just going to have to roll with sometimes these punches. And if you have a strong enough strategy, you'll plan for these things. So like, for example, seasonality plays a role. Um, also understanding exactly what the current landscape as it pertains to the sector, the market. What does that look like? Because even in a chip shortage, there's losers within a chip shortage. There's losers that were hiding in plain sight. Like, remember how Intel went on a dope run before its earnings and then look at what happens to intel right after like i said there's losers that are hiding in plain sight so essentially it's like and then on top of that you don't have to study everything come up with a thesis that maybe supports five to ten companies and stick with those 
literally like, you know, and honestly, stop as a bonus, stop trying to just play for leverage plays. Because if you have a bunch of leverage plays that are not leveraged against liquidity, then you're hurting yourself. If you're playing a leverage play, you start with, you, you should have started off with liquidity first. Because why? If your leverage play gets blown up, then ultimately you got liquidity there that will ultimately propel you and nine times out of 10, cover whatever the losses were for the leverage was. That's the whole point of leverage. The leverage just gives you that extra emphasis so that way when your thesis is correct and everything is moving correctly, then essentially it's like you're just earning, you're just earning off of the top. So essentially the other part is, is like, if you, you don't always have to just immediately just jump in study. Like those are the best things in which that I could say that if anything, these should be valuable lessons learned, valuable lessons learned for a lot of folks out there that wanted to just like, I remember hearing so many folks sending me messages via Instagram about like, okay, Hey Mark, I heard about your leverage play. I'm going to just go leverage. And this is my first trade. And I'm sitting there like, what are you doing? Go with the liquidity first. Start off with safety. Why? Because now you're acting just like institutional money. They lead with safety. And when they're ready to go risk on, then they can play leverage or go, uh, go at scale. But you need to have that foundation of liquidity first. Then once you play leverage, you're leveraging against your liquidity plays. You have something to leverage it against. Stop go trying to go for something in which that you believe that it's fast, is easy, and cheap. You know, because when you do that, you're subsidizing winners for losers. And what I mean by losers, I'm talking about the play itself, not the actual players. I guess those are the best things in which that I can give people today. And if we have to, we can go through another episode where we go a little bit more and deeper into like it, going through some of these lessons. But these are the biggest things first. Like whenever you jump into a car, you never just like immediately start driving you always put the seatbelt on first before you start to drive. If there's, a, if there's any type of issue on a plane, what is the first thing that they tell you when there's an emergency on the plane? Do your oxygen first. Take care of yourself first and then essentially help the idiot who didn't listen and follow the instructions. These are the simple things. Go with safety first and then essentially go with the things in which that when you can have the risk and you can stomach it, go for it. Well, I know we went a little bit over. I'm sorry for going 13 minutes over overboard, but you know, I felt like that was very, very valuable information. You know, many of you guys are going to run back. Um, you know, honestly, it's like, you know, you know, here's the thing when, even when you hear folks give out plays or when you hear plays out there in the street, or even when you hear plays from me, I've always expected you to do your own due diligence. I've always expected you to be even skeptical of me. Um, and I still do even to this day. I also expect that essentially it's like, yo, you lead with safety first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These are the valuable lessons that ultimately that we learn in the beginning. And then ultimately they carry us and propel us like, you know, when you walk away, you'll remember these steps in the walk away. You will. That's all I got. <laughs> all righty. Well, all right, y'all. This is ring closing time. I know, right? Uh, so for <laughs> all y'all, thank y'all for watching. Um, I hope that many of you have gained some significant value in this conversation. And hopefully you learned a little bit more about how institutional money sees it, how they see, how they see the table, some exercise and some homework for you. Cause it's been a minute since I've given that out, go through your portfolio or go through your watch list of picks and then look at your pick and then try to find two other competitors that go up against your pick. And then essentially list out what are the, what are the winning, what are the winning cards and what are the possibles? Mm -hmm. And then what are just the immediate, like just these are throwaways. And then compare that to everything else. You start doing that, now you're thinking like an institutional investor and it makes it easier in your road and path to win. Until next time, I'm Mark Monroe. And I'm Jolene GC. I'm rocking with AMD. No, I'm just kidding. In the place to be. <laughs> All right. And this has been your come up on 